All right, fig lovers, this is Ross the Fig Boss. Today's video, I thought I would take you guys around the fig forest and give you guys a bit of a tour today. We're gonna look at a number of the trees and kind of really evaluate them and look closely at them. I wanna give you guys an up close and personal view. There's a lot of times I'm sitting here talking in front of the camera and uh, it would be really nice to have somebody actually behind the camera film me while I while I talk and also film the trees, but can't always be so lucky. Um, in this case here, this is Brianzolo Rosso, and I've showed you guys this tree quite a bit this season. One of the things that we, we did actually earlier in the year was we tied it down here and we discussed how opening up the branches, putting them on a horizontal angle is gonna make the trees more productive, uh, not just this season, but in the future. Um, and so that was something we did to all the trees. We tried to evaluate them and see if we, there was a way we could stake the trees, like in the case of this Ron de Bordeaux, and open these guys up. That was a really critical thing. If you guys missed the lesson on that, I would highly recommend going back and watching. But one of the things I wanna show you about this, this uh, Brianzolo Rosso is a couple things actually. It's producing Breva, and it's not supposed to, meaning this is a unifera common fig, at least to my knowledge. Maybe it does produce Breba, but a lot of trees will kind of trick you and they'll form their Brebas earlier in the season, probably in the first 15 days of, of the tree waking up from dormancy. And then the Brebas will form and a lot of them will fall right off, whether the tree is supposed to produce them or not. Um, if it's not supposed to produce them, a lot of times they'll fall off. If they are supposed to produce them, in some cases, like I showed you guys with this Moro de Caneva tree, the tree doesn't have necessarily enough energy to dedicate to all of those Brebas. And so the tree just rejects a number of them so that it can continue growing, of course. And if it doesn't have enough energy stored within it, as the tree wakes up, it makes it really difficult to bear a heavy and reliable Breba crop. So the trees just end up dropping them within the first 15 days. But then if they start hanging on, more and more it's likely that the Brebas, you can kind of count your chickens there and they'll actually start to ripen roughly 90 days after they wake up. But about 60 days after they wake up, they're entering their third, uh, third ripening stage as all the figs go through, whether it's main crop or Brebas. And in this third ripening stage, I think there's something that happens to the Brebas on unifera varieties like Brianzola rosa where the brabos will start to turn yellow and start to become soft and they'll eventually fall off. So they kind of play a trick on you. Celeste loves to do this. Um, I've seen it on um, a number of different trees over the years where they'll form brabos, get to the right size and you think, oh my God, we're almost there, we got it. They're gonna ripen and then they don't. Um, so it is a bit of a shame for whatever reason that happens, I think genetically certain varieties are just not really meant to produce Brebas. And so even though the Brianzolo Rosso Brebas actually look really good here, um, I think a lot of them will probably, or all of them will fall off. I'll update you guys on the progress of that if they do indeed ripen. But what's interesting about this tree is we didn't take off a lot of the apical buds as well. That's another point I wanna make. And when we did our winter pruning, we came in here and give you guys a lesson in the spring about pruning these trees. And it took off very minimal amounts of growth. We actually cut right back in here and we cut out this main shoot that was really, really high and towering over the rest of the tree and actually towering over kind of the trees behind it. Um, and so we took it out for that reason and up came some of these water shoots actually these are gonna, believe it or not, somehow produce figs. They're not technically water shoots somehow. Um, they uh, are not as vigorous hormonally as I would have expected them to be. And actually we might end up getting some development there, some fruit development on those branches. But on these other branches that we, we left, we left them all alone. We did not prune away the apical buds. And you can see here, this is last year's growth and there's a dividing line right there. So where it turns from this brown color to then green, there's a distinct line right there. 
And that's just the continuation of the apical bud. The bud was overwintered. Um, we did not prune it away. And so because we didn't prune it away, it just continued growing vertically like this. And I was hoping when you, when you preserve these apical buds, there's definitely a benefit. We talked about that in a, in a video we did earlier this year too. That's a valuable lesson where you can see that, I mean, the branches that have those apical buds, they're producing fruit very early versus the branches where we did a lot of pruning. You can see how much further behind like these branches are. So uh, if the tree doesn't have to kind of recover and regrow these branches and it just continues from these apical buds, you end up getting a really early crop of Maine, which is a huge advantage in, in my opinion. Uh, that's what I wanted. But we're now seeing, because we didn't remove the apical bud, we're now seeing not a whole lot of branching. And this tree is rather sparse. Look at the look at the tree you can really see through it which is actually not great um, in the case of a fig tree if you can't really see through it it's going to be more productive than if you of course can see through it now there are gaps in every tree depending on how much pruning you do and where your cuts are and uh, a lot of that can be a factor but then you have other trees like this lsu tiger <laughs> This is the total opposite, where the leaves are just so large and have, so the tree is really well spaced and has a great structure to it, that the tree is very full. And it's as full as it can get. It can't get any more full, because if it is, it's gonna really start shading itself out. And I'm not gonna get the production that I want. So this tree uh, is really doing its, itself justice and it's pretty much perfect. Every single leaf is corresponding to a new fruit but look how full it looks. And this is the tree right here that has these big palmata single heart lobed leaves here. Um, this is another tree down here, this is Campaneri. And there's another tree over here, Ninzi S. But um, this is just exactly kind of what we want. We want this whole area to just look like a full mat of fig leaves. Um, and that would give me the most production possible. Now, of course, like I said, you can get too dense with this. You can get too full and you won't get enough leaves or you won't get any fruit. Um, so you gotta be careful. But in the case of this Brianzola rosa, if I had actually removed these apical buds, again, you can see this, the continuation line right there. If I removed these, we would have had a lot more branching. It would have forced the tree to branch out and be a lot more full rather than so lanky and long and, and sparse in the middle here. Um, so, you know, lesson learned, each tree is a little bit different, but what we can do now to, to recover this and make this uh, rectify the situation is I came in here and I actually just removed the growth tips. I removed the apical buds. Now, if I don't remove them in the spring or the winter time, Who's to say I can't remove them now in the, during the growing season? Nothing wrong with that. So I just come in here with my thumb. We did a video on this recently. Maybe if it's not out already, it's gonna come out where I'm just coming in here and pinching. That's why it's called pinching, but it's really just a form of summer pruning, not nipping, topping, uh, rivers pruning. There's so many names for it. And actually what this is gonna do is dramatically increase my production this season on the branches in which it's performed. Because then what's gonna happen is that this, this branch is gonna leaf out. Let's use this branch here as an example instead, because it doesn't have sap on it. But it'll start putting out a vegetative bud here, a vegetative bud there, a vegetative bud here, and maybe even one down there. And so instead of getting just one single continuous shoot that will continue to produce fruit until it stops growing for the, the growing season, I now will have three or four fruiting branches, those new vegetative shoots will come out um, and actually will produce more main crop. And that way I have, of course, uh, you know, a lot more figs that way. We did a video on, uh, on this exact topic. I would highly recommend you guys check it out. I've talked about it on the blog as well, figboss.com. One of the trees I just want you guys to look at is this Moro de Caneva. Um, it is insanely productive. 
so many bravas on it. It's taking up a lot of space though. It is quite sparse. And so the same thing should have been done to this tree. I will come in here probably and remove this apical bud here, but I've already came in here and, and removed the, the tips on a lot of this growth to try to encourage it to, to branch out. We did that actually last year as well. We did the same technique. Uh, we also did the same technique on this uh, green Maturinska over here and the Ronde Bordeaux that you guys have probably seen many times. But these trees, uh, when you do this, they become so productive and they produce uh, two different sets of main crop that ripen at very different times of the growing season. So the second flush of growth that's gonna happen, even on this green Maturinska, I removed a, a couple growth tips here. The second flush of growth is gonna then uh, produce main crop much later in the growing season and I'll end up having um, figs that ripen all the way to frost or let's say a lot of these will start ripening in, in October or if I'm lucky the middle of September um, then October and then all the way to frost which is fantastic that's exactly what uh, what I want um, and I think anybody would want you know, you can time this really well. And, and even here in the Philadelphia area, you can get two sets of main crop. Been doing it for years, seriously. And I've, I've actually put together a video, hoping to publish that, edit it all together, where we went through last year, three different times of the year and showed you the progress of, you know, of that process with this Ronde Bordeaux fig here that you guys are looking at. Th this Ronde Bordeaux looks great, by the way, as well. And I'll just say that this is probably gonna produce 350, 400 figs again, even though I really pruned the heck out of it last year. Like, tried to, I probably sold 20 sets of cuttings off of this. That's 60 feet of wood um, off of this one tree. And um, maybe even more than that, actually. And it still looks great. And that's the thing with this tree. You can prune the heck out of it and it still produces amazing production. Um, you can see the tips are removed. Anywhere these branches have really large leaves, that was the, that's the secret to it. But if I could just leave this tree alone for a year, oh my goodness, this thing would become massive. Kind of just like this green Michurinska, I've, I've pretty much left it alone for like two years. And this is the results of it. It's the biggest tree on the property and it's insanely productive. The main crop, there's fruits on every single node and the uh, Brabas in here are, I can't even believe how productive this is. But I would say for the sheer surface area, or I don't know why I said sheer, but for the surface area here of the tree, and, and if you look at the production based on the surface area, of the Bravas, you end up getting this fig here, this long de oot, is probably the most productive Brava producer on the property. They're massive. They look like eggplants. That's another name for it, Melanzana in Italy, or eggplant. And so there's a lot of them. Uh, there's so much of them that actually the new growth has really been kind of stunted, believe it or not. The, the amount of growth is much slower. Leaves are much smaller than normal on this tree. Um, uh, but again, the, the Brabas are all over the place. There's some back here. There's like four or five on this branch. It's so, there's actually a lot of Brabas just right here. If you just look here, here, on that branch, on this branch, on this branch, that branch, there's some in here. Uh, <laughs> It's like Brabus everywhere. Uh, it's a beautiful sight. There's some on that branch back there that we did a lot of limb bending on to open that up a bit to get more, um, more branching out of this tree. The more I can get the branching to form and the slower this tree grows, the better off I'm gonna be because the fruits are gonna be a lot smaller that way. And if the, the fruits are smaller, I'll, I'll actually be able to eat them because if they're too big, I'm telling you, there's wasps, uh, fruit flies, all kinds of stuff that just comes in here and will ruin every single one of them. So, you know, you just have to, unfortunately, uh, I just took the camera off the tripod. Hold on, give me one second, guys, to get this back on. Sorry, I don't want to have to edit this. I guess I'll have to edit that part out, but 
but I don't, excuse the camera work, but here, I wanted to show you this Moro de Caneva really quickly. Again, it just has Brabas all over it. Um, and I, if you can really afford to open this up like we've done with some of these branches, because I can force them out this way easily, it's more difficult to take this and bend it down here because then it's just shading out all so many other trees. Same thing with this branch back here. It's just such a large branch that I can't really bend it too much outwards, even though that would be the, the, the right way to go about it um, to increase the production of this tree. And, and again, removing the growth tips is gonna make a huge difference on, on this tree. Um, I didn't remove all of them. I want it to continue to grow. I need, I need it to continue to grow. It's probably beneficial. You can see where the density here is much more full um, versus some of these other branches. Like I said, we removed out, uh, we didn't remove the apical buds and it, it just is quite sparse in those areas. But right here, it's not. And you can see how much smaller the leaves are. And I would say how much more productive the tree potentially is as well. Um, just in this small given area, it's more productive than let's say the same area right here. Um, again, because of that, that branching. So this is really critical. I think those of you guys out there want to get really good at this. Um, what else do we got? Another tree I'll say is really full. Like the, the tiger, the LSU tiger is just Celeste. This is stallion. And this thing is unbelievably full. Um, it just you can't even see through it at all like compared to the other trees that we looked at uh, this is just unbelievably just a mat and by the way we did not remove the apical buds on this so it's amazing how the difference can be if you just know your trees really well and which ones you should prune and which ones you shouldn't prune or how much pruning exactly to do on each one and each tree is just so different and the branching on this is just unbelievable. Just on this one branch, without doing any pruning, I got one, two, three, four, five, uh, what is that? Yeah, so I got six new branches to form. And if this was the main trunk of the tree, it would have six new scaffolds. And by the way, they all are filled with fruits, even on the shadier parts of this tree. Now, here's the other caveat that happens with this fig. Uh, even though it's so full, that's actually a detriment because Smith will, or Celeste, excuse me, will drop some figs that are in the shade. If, if the sun isn't really coming in and hitting the fruit buds as they're ripening and almost ripe, they're going to do something like what they did here in the second drop phase of the Brabas that we looked at. And that the Brabas, just like these, uh, these main crop figs, will just fall right off. And again, I think it's the sunlight. I've said this for years um, with other varieties like St. Martin, Pastelier, uh, Celeste is a classic one where they will just drop their main crop. And some people blame, oh, it's just a maturity thing. It's just this, it's just that. All right, well, we'll find out. If it's a maturity thing, this tree is pretty darn mature. And we'll find out if that's the case. But I know for a fact on the younger ones, definitely is up until this point, it's been about that sunlight. And if you just make sure that you have an open center, the opposite of what this tree is, see how full it is? We don't want it to be this full. Um, and so maybe you're actually better off, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to solve this problem actually. If you have a tree that's this full, you can't make it less full in a way. I guess you could remove some of the leaves. You could um, bend the branches outwards like we, we talked about. Um, but it's hard to really bend any of this because um, the branches are not exactly very long. And I, I can't certainly bend much of this as it is because, um, well, I guess I could. Maybe I should come in here and, and do some bending any way I can. Because even just opening up that really brings in the light into the center of the tree. And that makes a huge difference right off the bat. And it's not, you know, I was really worried if I were to do that, is it gonna affect any of the trees around it? But there isn't actually really any trees around it. Just this little guy right here that you guys can't see. But yeah, I think that's probably wise. Let me do that. I'm gonna do that probably today. Um, 
but that is a uh, yeah that's the total opposite example um, we do have a white triana fig back here I, I think it's just an absolute beast I mean an, an absolute beast of a fig it is so vigorous the leaves are huge the uh, fruits are massive it's uh, it's just one of them trees man that gets real big real fast and produces a ton of larger sized figs and uh, it's actually not something I prefer uh, but it just should be noted that this thing is just an absolute beast I've pruned actually pruned a lot of growth out of this and tried to keep it in hormonal balance again you know the the apical buds are totally intact here just a continuation and look how much growth is already on this thing huge node spacing larger leaves i actually came in here and topped it i got to find a way to slow it down otherwise this is going to be a big tree and it's going to shade out everything else around it um, but yeah there's a azores dark right there that's looking great nice and mature can't wait to taste the figs off that man the birds ate every single one of them last year the birds know man and they ate that they ate that one more than any other <laughs> any other fig i'm telling you um they just went berserk for that uh <laughs> for that fig um here is uh two others i want to look at closely as well we have lsu huye down here which has formed a really nice structure and it's really wide and open um and then right next to it right here i'll just shake it is jh adriatic and this JH Adriatic hasn't yet formed the pea-sized figs like the rest of these have. Um, actually, LSU Huye is a little bit behind. Uh, maybe there, yeah, there's some pea-sized figs there. What am I saying? Yeah, there's definitely larger figs there. Um, this one again is a it's a mid to late season variety, so you just you can't really expect it to compete in terms of the size of the fruits and the and the how the fruits are doing at this point compared to some early varieties like this LSU Huye. Uh, but uh, it's almost there, you know, we're really not that far away. And you, and you just have to think that if, if this fig can produce, and it's probably gonna produce, I would imagine by like uh, maybe even August 15th this year, wouldn't that be nice? Because if you fast forward about 90 days from today, today's June, um, June 2nd, I believe. Um, yeah, June 2nd. So if you fast forward from today, 90 days, that puts us, I think, in like early September. But you never know. These might take less than that 90-day average to actually ripen. Now, uh, if they would just form already and get, get out here and, and be pea-sized all of a sudden, I mean, they're, they're almost there. Then I would say, all right, you know, Definitely by September 1st, no doubt. But if we're lucky, and we'll find out if I can get them by August 15th, that would be absurd. Um, I don't think that's possible. I pro it's probably not, because I think the green Michurinska is gonna probably ripen around then. And you know, w really what determines the varieties in terms of when they ripen is of course, how progressed the fruits are at this point. Because once they're pea-sized, on the branch you can then count the number of days from that point so here's an example this is a pea-sized fig down here and this is lsu huye so about i don't know the exact numbers but i would guess about 80 days from today that fig will be ripe someone might suggest 75 anywhere between 75 and 85 days this this fig will be ripe. Now others, like really, really early figs, like um, Ron de Bordeaux is the tree behind, the, behind me. This is um, gonna ripen in about 65 days or 70 days from today. And uh, the math basically points this fig here to being August 1st because it's just so much shorter than the 90 days. Plus, we've already had figs that were pea-sized on this tree for quite a while, I think. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, I would not, I would not, ex I would expect again this year, a lot of the figs in the yard, uh, based on where they're at over here on the west side of the property, 
and also on the north side of the property, which we haven't shown you guys yet, they're going to definitely ripen maybe even August 1st, but if I'm lucky, uh, the last week of July, which would be exceptional. Um, absolutely a huge gift. We love that. If we could just get them a little bit earlier than normal, that'd be amazing. But then this, this uh, LSU Huye, you know, it's more likely that this is going to start ripening maybe the the second week of August or the, or the, yeah, I mean, probably somewhere in the second week of August, maybe the 7th to the 15th of August um, versus the 1st of August. And then you've got JHA Dratic, which is that mid-season, late, late variety that'll ripen probably, again, maybe towards the end of August or even beginning of September. Um, another variety I want to mention and show you guys is actually this one here. This has done really well this year. I don't know what has happened, but I, I have a new theory of mine. Uh, although this tree is just, it's quite old at this point. I don't know. Uh, maybe the theory is completely wrong because I think this is year four that this tree has survived with some significance to it. So this would be four, three, two, and then this is one. So yeah, um, yeah, this is probably now in its fourth season. And, but it's finally now producing figs. Look at that. And I mean a lot of figs. I, I kept saying year two, year three, this thing would produce, a, it should have produced a ton of fruit, but every variety is different. I mean, Smith, which is what this is. It's basically Smith, it's Texas BA1. It just takes a long time to get its hormones in check. It's the same thing here with this. Look at this part of the tree. Look how much younger this is. That's, uh, that's three years ago. That's two years ago. Uh, so that's one year old wood one-year-old wood, I think two-year-old wood, and then three-year-old wood. So yeah, we need to have like on this tree, unfortunately, this three, even though this is three years old, that trunk, it needs to be in year four before it's actually gonna produce anything. And I would say probably Colonel Littman's Black Cross is in a similar boat, similar boat. Um, other varieties I can think of, I think Villa de Bordeaux in some situations can take actually three years you need a tree that's survived the winter for three seasons and then that third in that third year i should say so it needs to survive the the winter for two seasons and then in the third year that's when you get the uh massive production i mean it, w it will be massive it's totally worth the wait um but most of the figs man that i've seen will produce in that second season in a big way um so it's it's kind of rare actually to get trees like Smith and Colonel Littman's. I think those are the, on the extreme ends of it. Um, here's a uh, older Campanieri, but the rest of these trees in here and this other west side of the property, this other plot I have here, they are you know, really just now um, entering their second season. So you know, that's the thing, even though they're in their second season, not all of them are gonna produce this season. In fact, this one here, uh, LSU Strawberry, isn't going to produce this year. That's a real damn shame because I'm really looking forward to that fig and I really want to see more of it that I've, I've seen in the past. Um, it's just, it's, you know, it's probably a really underrated variety in my opinion. Um, although, you know, I don't mind waiting. It just is what it is. But this year it should survive the winter a lot better because... Um, we were able to protect the branches for one season, bend them over to the ground. Here's the wood chips that we put down, covers all the branches. And then uh, from there, we're, we're golden. We don't really have to do a whole lot of protection on some of these trees. At that point, I'll find out, you know, once they're unprotected, which ones are, are hardier than others. And uh, we can kind of go from there. Yeah, so this fig godfather, I wish would do the same thing. And I wish it would produce this in its second year, but it could actually, I think it's actually in its third season if you count this growth here. 
Um, so now this could be its third year, but typically you're gonna need something a bit more um, reliable than that, of some kind of a base to the tree that uh, will enable it to, to actually produce in that, in that third year, uh, or in that second year. Uh, but again, in that, in that case, that's, that tree's case, it's gonna produce much heavily. Uh, if it does produce something, I'll be happy this year, but I think I'm gonna have to wait to that third year um, for it to really produce something significant. Uh, but you know, varieties of here like this, Campaneri, will just produce right away. And this is a fig that's been producing for a while. I don't really know what happened to this leaf. Something burned it or something happened to it. Maybe it got damaged, but this has got fruit all over it. Uh, Campaneri is just such an easy to grow, reliable fig, so many different places, and it tastes amazing. Uh, here we actually have a young tree this is um, Corinth, and it looks like I might actually get a taste of this, looking at the, the buds there. Now what I'll do is I'll probably let this grow, and if it can really get some nice growth to it that's really healthy and vigorous, I'll top it. Otherwise, I'll leave it alone, and then I'll top it in the, in the wintertime or the spring. But getting some of these suckers to come up from the base is really a sign that it's going to be rather vigorous and healthy and it's really starting to come into its own but I only see one down here and it's not very vigorous so uh, maybe I'll top this down here and that will encourage more suckers to form don't know uh, what else do we got here this is a new one to me finally gonna get to try it shout out to my friend Raphael and his friend whoever gave him this tree this is Demos Unknown Demos family unknown. I guess the Demos family. Shout out to the Demos family. I don't know who they are. Uh, but uh, we got some figs forming in there. And again, this is just one of them figs, man. It never survived the winter until I protected it. Finally, I protected it. And look at the production on it. It's doing fantastic. Probably should top this and will at some point, this, this main shoot, just to get it to branch out a bit more. Um, also here, we have some Pastelier. We already topped this to get it to branch out, but uh, this is Pastelier, Ciro, and Pork Rolls. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right. From a conservatory in France. Planted a young Dalmatie down here. Hopefully this does pretty good to replace my Gayette tree. And then we have the one down here. Planted this actually last year. Hoping this will come into its own now and do something. It's hard to really hard to establish young trees in such a cold place. And uh, especially if you're not irrigating them and, and have good soil, which is this plot's struggle. This plot has always had poor soil and that's why the trees in here are so small. Um, and it's mainly because I used to have a raised bed in here, just like this one, but larger, another, another six inches taller. And it was filled with uh, peat moss and it just sits on top of the soil. And um, I didn't add mulch for many years to this bed. And I should have, because that peat moss, if it becomes dry, which it does over the course of the growing season, you will, uh, you will regret it. And your, your trees and whatever you have growing in there is not gonna really grow because it just will become dry. Um, and you know, that's obviously a problem. Let's grab a cherry. This is a long video. Mm. It ain't ready just yet, but I eat them anyway. Birds are gonna get them at some point. They're already starting to get some. But this year, for some reason, I'm really lucky with the birds. I don't know why that is. All right. If you made it this far in a video, thanks. I usually say that, I said that a lot in the past, but you guys are the true fans of this YouTube channel. And I thank you for that. All right, cherry breaks over. Okay, let's look at this plot. There's 60 trees in here. <laughs> Um, 
This is the southern plot. It's, um, it's amazing how different each plot is. You know, once you, find, once you really observe these trees and careful about it, I mean, this is a young plot right here, but it's such a vast difference from that plot we just looked at. But you look at the trees and you think, wow, they look rather similar. But you think about the amount of time it took <laughs> for this plot to do its thing compared to the other plot. It's a night and day difference. So uh, this plot is the same, same thing, I think. Um, the trees in here are gonna be larger generally because the trees that we finally protected, the, the branches that we protected last year were very, very large, some of them. Some of them were so large I couldn't actually protect them and we let them go and just let them do their thing and they actually did survive. It was rather mild last year and that's a good example here is this Texas peach, Texas peach fig. This is um, just another name for Celeste. People have said that uh, it's different than Celeste. Uh, we're gonna find out, I guess, this year. We got a lot of fruit up in here and it should ripen to a really high quality. I think I finally also have one in a pot that could produce some high quality fruit as well. Look at this, we have uh, some Brabas on this Neruchiola de Elba fig. This is a really, really good Braba producer. I don't think people know that. Um, it's one of the heavier producers this year is Long de Oot, Elba, Norino, and Green Michurinska. They're definitely in a league of their own right now, I think. Um, here's another Long de Oot. This is uh, Rosa Esmeralda, just by a different name. Um, I'm hoping that this is actually going to be different enough than Long de Oot that it's worth keeping. Because long to oot is a troublesome, troublesome variety. And uh, if it's not uh, doing its thing, then I'm going to probably get rid of it. Uh, here is um, Colonel Lippmann's Black Cross. And I'm really, really hoping that this tree is going to have the right hormones this year to fruit. But it doesn't look like it is. I can tell usually just by looking at it, I don't even have to look at the fruit buds and I'll know if the tree is gonna fruit or not based on how it's behaving. It looks like there might be a fruit bud back in there. Maybe. <coughs> we'll have to wait and see, but I don't, uh, I'm not banking on it, that's for sure. Here we have a just absolute beautiful tree. I couldn't have asked for a perfect a more perfect beginning to a tree's life. Um, again, we bent, we bent all these branches over to the ground, you know. Um, there's the main stem that comes up from last year, and then eventually it just stopped growing, and then we let them, we let them grow and do their thing. But this Marseillaise, ooh, this thing came up, and it's got growth on it on basically every node along this main stem. And it just has formed, because of that, so many scaffolds. And it's actually producing figs there. At a really early date, this will ripen, probably middle of August. Even, th even though this is a relatively young, younger tree and younger, uh, younger shoots there, but we also have suckers that come up and these are gonna be really valuable for cuttings for me spread this awesome variety around. This is such an underrated fig, I think because of the name, it's similar to white Marseille and people think, oh, it must be similar, but it's very different. Very, very different. Can't wait to talk more about it. Um, now this I think is uh, my Thermalito and you can see the fruit buds are, looks like they are popping out. This is, a, it's actually it's third season third season so two years it took for the growth to survive the winter for it to to actually fruit and i think that's going to hold true with with these figs you know uh they just take a certain amount of time for them to grow and eventually fruit um and it's just a lot easier obviously if you had these in places where it was mild <laughs> and you didn't have to deal with the winter time um what a joy that would be we also have this Col Noir is fruiting. 
same thing. I think this is now in its third season, um, and it's it's wonderful. We got some Brava. We're gonna have main crop. I think probably probably on most of the tree. I don't know if the whole thing is gonna produce the way I would like it to, but it's fine by me. Just so I can get at least something off of it. Here is a Blanche de Dieu Cezanne. This is such a fantastic tasting fig. Adriatic type, but just so I can get this tree more established, that's a huge advantage. It's such a weird, almost like dwarf version of, uh, of Adriatic, you know? Um, I don't think people have ever really thought about that. That's kind of an original idea at this point uh, of mine, but it does. It just seems like a dwarf version of it. Um, maybe that'll change in the future, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, interestingly enough, this is probably the longest shoot in the, of the yard that I was able to uh, overwinter successfully. It's, it was like a seven foot long shoot from the base there. I don't think any of the other shoots, eh, maybe the Rose Esmeralda and uh, actually, yeah, the Weiss is pretty big and so is Texas Peach, but I wasn't sure, man, if this, even though it's one year, it's one year of growth that's seven feet long. It grew seven feet last year. Would this fig actually fruit this year? The answer is yes. And there is a lot of fruit actually forming up in there. You can see it. The uh, double dots and uh, pea-sized fruits are, are coming in. So that's amazing. That's Pastelier from Rain Tree. I would have expected the opposite. I would have expected it would have taken another year. Similar to this uh, Smith, we've overwintered a Smith here. And I've overwintered um, Nero 600M, AKA Violet de Bordeaux. Um, but it just looks like to me that both of these are not gonna fruit this year. Even though we were able to protect them. Um, same thing with La Bourgeoisie, I think is right, yeah, it's right there. This is near 600M with more of it down over there. But you can see, this really proves my point, I think, even more. Down here is a shoot that comes off of growth uh, from the base. So this section of the Nero 600M tree is actually fruiting. You'd think it's actually shaded out pretty good. So you'd be like, oh, how is the shadier part of the tree producing when you have this upper growth here that is, uh, it's not producing and it's getting plenty of light. It's all in the hormones, guys. Because if you look down here, this growth that we just looked at is coming from a base of the, of the tree that has survived now above ground. And so this new growth here that you see is now into its third year. It's not in its second year, it's in its third season. So that's why this is fruiting and that's why we'll get to eat some Violet de Bordeaux figs this year. Huge, huge uh, for me because I, I really, um, I really haven't had a Vila de Bordeaux fig in like, <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's actually been quite a, quite a while. Um, here's something interesting we did. Um, I actually got rid of all my Vila de Bordeaux trees except for that Nero 600M. And I kind of regret it. I should have kept at least one of them. But I thought that Vila de Bordeaux would fruit a lot sooner than it has. Um, I think that tree's been there for like almost seven years or something. Anyway, this might be its seventh or sixth year, one of the two. But here is uh, two trees we planted recently. We have, uh, I think, Vertolino and Salame. This is also right here, a Shia Black from UC Davis. And I basically just took the branches and bent them outwards in this direction towards the garden as much as possible. And what this has done is it allowed the trees to, of course, I think fruit easier and branch out better. Um, and also allow the tree, when you do this, allow the tree to send up some suckers. It kind of encourages it to sucker a little bit because now the, the root zone's here, but the growth is all over here. And I think then it may, tries to make use of this light in here and is more likely to send up some really healthy growth. And that's kind of what I want, you know, to try to keep making this 
a Shia Black healthier and healthier every year. Um, that's the goal. And the only way you can do that is to encourage suckers to form. So I either have to keep cutting it back, which will definitely make it sucker, or it has to sucker on its own. And so far it's not doing that. We haven't been able to successfully get it to sucker this season. So unfortunate that it's not suckering. But here's an example right here. This is uh, either Vertolino or Salame, one of the two. Look at all the suckers that are forming right down there at the base, because now the tree is kind of off, off in that direction. So, I mean, truthfully not, not the best examples, but that's theoretically what should happen when you do that. Um, something really exciting for me is these two trees right here. This is um, called an Om Noir. Again, it's overwintered successfully, but I think we need another year with it. So this thing, I'm not seeing any fruit buds on it, and I don't think it will fruit at all this year. We'll get some nice suckers out of it. I think I'll air layer one of them maybe, put it in a pot for next year. It's always good to have more cold anoms, but this, this, if we can get it through the next season, will fruit. One more winter, baby, one more winter. And then right here is the same boat, I think, De La Roca. De La Roca. Just an exceptional fig, but in general, I just want this to be, I just want this to grow. It's not established enough. I don't have a De La Roca established enough in the ground, and, and I regret that. Uh, here's a same thing, man. It's a shame. This is Noir de Barbantane, same thing with this, and it's just growing so vigorously. Even though it has growth from last year, just like the Nero 600M, just like Le Bourgeoisie, just like Smith, we need another year out of it. And hopefully we'll get the fruit. I mean, the Texas BA1 we looked at, that took, like I said, I think this is its fourth growing season. Actually, it might even be the fifth. What did I say? I don't even remember but it takes a long time. That's the point. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's kind of it here, guys. Those are the trees I really wanted to show you. Uh, this tree, I like how this one's kind of going out into the garden and we staked it there with some twine that's just connected down here at the base with a, a garden staple, right in the middle of the parsley. <laughs> and uh, it should start branching out, leafing out along this, this bare portion of the tree, which is really what I want. Uh, we'll see. We shall see. But yeah, like I said, guys, that's it. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button, please. Hit the like button. We'll see you guys for the next video. Take care.